Today, we celebrate, we commemorate Memorial Day. The holiday itself, of course, is tomorrow, but today we give religious meaning and thought to it. Memorial Holiday, Memorial Day is a federal holiday that commemorates those who have died in military service. It began in the wake of the Civil War, with towns setting aside a day to honor the fallen in their area by decorating their graves. And because of this, it was originally called Decoration Day. Each community celebrated in their own way at different times in those early years. In 1868, though, General John A. Logan declared that Decoration Day should be celebrated on May 30th. He chose that date because it was not the anniversary of any Civil War battle. His proclamation reads, the 30th of May, 1868 is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and Hamlet churchyard in the land. What I find most interesting about the origins of Memorial Day is that those graves that were decorated belonged to soldiers who had fought on both sides. General Logan declared the holiday for those who fought for the North because he was the head of the Northern Veterans Association. However, it was a common practice for townspeople to decorate the graves of all soldiers, Union or Confederate, who had lost their lives in battle and been interred in those cities, villages, and Hamlet churchyards. I find this very moving. Moving beyond words, really. This simple act of decency, of honoring one who has died for what they believed was right, regardless of your agreement with them, is perhaps the pinnacle of human compassion. In the four years of the American Civil War, our country lost over one million lives to military service. That is compared to approximately 50,000 military casualties in the American Revolutionary War. The country was stunned by those losses. I think that civilians grieved for military personnel on both sides because they knew what it was to love and lose someone. They knew that those fallen soldiers were loved by someone, somewhere, who probably had no idea where that young man was laid to rest. And so they decorated their graves. In those moments, their humanity was more important than their political affiliation. I think we can learn something from that in our current moment. I had the opportunity to experience something of this remarkable compassion during my ministerial, ministerial formation. One of the lesser known requirements of serving as a ministerial intern in Boston is mandatory participation in the annual reenactments of the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Every spring, each town plays their own part in retelling the ride of Paul Revere, the muster of the Minutemen, and whatever else was transpiring in their town during the time of the Revolution. I served as the ministerial intern of the first parish in Lincoln, Massachusetts. And each year, the Lincoln Minutemen Fife and Drum Record reenacts the muster of the Minutemen and their march to the neighboring town of Concord. The first leg of their journey is to the town graveyard where they honor the fallen. And the town parson accompanies them on their journey. 
and the parson is played by the minister or the intern <laughs> of the first parish of Lincoln, which was organized years before the Revolutionary War. During the second year of my internship, it was my turn to be the parson for the minivan reenactment. And to be totally honest, I really didn't get it. I understood that it was important and that there was no way I was getting out of it. <laughs> but I was deeply annoyed at having to spend a Sunday afternoon walking around Lincoln wearing a costume. Because yes, there is a parson costume that is dutifully handed down from one first parish minister to the next, tri-corner hat and everything. As I prepared for my big adventure with the Minutemen, I learned more about the events that transpired in Lincoln and what exactly we were commemorating. It turns out that during the original muster in 1775, None of the Lincoln Minutemen fell. There are Lincoln Minutemen buried in that graveyard, but they died in later battles. Who we were honoring, who died during the, mar the march to Concord, were British soldiers who had been killed by the Lincoln Minutemen. That is who was buried in that graveyard, and that is who we were there to honor. The story goes that it was forbidden for anybody to bury the bodies of British soldiers. That was one of the ways that the American patriots hoped to demoralize the British loyalists. But a local woman, Mary Hartwell, defied that order. Under cover of darkness, and I'm told while pregnant, Mary Hartwell stole out of her house, found the bodies of the British soldiers, and buried them herself. This act of defiance, of courage, and compassion is what the parson from the first parish in Lincoln is charged with commemorating during the burial ground ceremony at the annual muster of the Minutemen. And that was my honor to play that role. That's something I can get behind. I'm grateful that I had that opportunity. It changed my understanding of what things like war reenactments are for. I had always understood them to be a kind of a glorification of war. But having been through that experience with the Lincoln Minutemen fighting their own war, I realized that for many, war reenactment is about trying to make sense of our history, not necessarily holding it up as an exemplar. And in the case of this reenactment, I learned something that I never expected. In the midst of the chaos and vitriol of battle, there was still a compassion, an acknowledgement of the humanity of the other that I would never have come to know otherwise. This was driven home by the words of one of my traveling companions that day the British consulate. I was surprised by how many events like this the British consulate in New England attends each year. It's a gracious act and one that helps maintain the ties between our nations. I'll never forget his words. As we stood in that graveyard <coughs> over the final resting place of these British soldiers who had given their lives and service to their country, he said, we are here today to remember and honor people who gave their lives in this war. They fought for what they believed. One side for the belief in unity under a king, the other side struggling for freedoms the world had never known. Both fought with valor, and it is our duty now to remember them. I imagine that that attitude of the British consulate's office has evolved over time. I didn't get a chance to ask him when they began participating in these reenactment ceremonies all over the Boston area. But I think that we can safely assume that it was not for a while after the revolution. 
It took time, it took hard work for the United Kingdom and the United States to form a relationship after the American Revolution. But we did. Here we are. I share this story with you because I find it an interesting parallel to the story at the beginning of Memorial Day. Each of the northern states adopted Decoration Day as a state holiday of their own accord. The southern states, however, commemorated their war dead in their own way until after the First World War. The wounds were too deep for that expression of unity for about 50 years. Perhaps what allowed the North and the South to come together to celebrate Memorial Day was the shift in focus from exclusively honoring civil war dead to honoring the fallen of any U.S. military campaign. Perhaps it was the healing effects of time. Or perhaps it was being brought together in new military service against a common enemy during the First World War. Whatever the reason, the joint participation of the North and South in Memorial Day is a sign of reconciliation between the two sides that had once held nothing but contempt for each other. For decades, the holiday was, separated, was celebrated on May 30th by both Northern and Southern states alike. It was in 1968 that Congress declared Memorial Day a federal holiday always celebrated on the last Monday of May. That law came into effect in 1971. The reason that Congress put the holiday on a Monday was so federal employees and many other Americans could enjoy a three-day weekend. And I can't help but feel that perhaps this is when we started losing contact with the original meaning of the holiday. Uh, don't misunderstand me, I'm all for three-day weekends. <laughs> However, I think this is when we as a nation began thinking of Memorial Day as the official start of the summer season rather than a somber remembrance of our military dead. There's nothing wrong with hot dogs and swimming pools. <laughs> One could argue that an all-American Memorial Day with fireworks and a cookout is part of the lifestyle that our military dead gave their lives for. We, gave, we have this life because people have given theirs. When we celebrate Memorial Day, we can honor that sacrifice if we take a moment to reflect on the great and tragic loss that undergirds all of our freedom. One of my habits for Veterans Day and Memorial Day is to look up demographics about who is serving in our military. It's hard to find exact numbers about how many Americans are serving where for obvious reasons. The figures that I could find indicate that we currently have about 300,000 troops deployed in more than 150 nations. The war in Afghanistan has been going on for 17 years and seven months. This is the longest military engagement in the history of the United States, surpassing the Vietnam conflict. There are about 1.3 million people currently in active duty. 13.8% of them are under the age of 25. 36% of them are 30 years of age or younger. That's who we're talking about on Memorial Day. We're talking about young people who have lost their lives on behalf of this country and the promises upon which it was built. Our military dead dreamed a better life for everyone they loved and for strangers that they never met. The circumstances that leads one to military service can be as complicated as a family legacy, as earnest as fulfilling a duty to God and country or as brutally simple as having no other options available. Whatever the circumstances that brought our fallen into military service, they did their duty just the same. 
and to echo the words of the British consulate from so many years ago, it is now our duty to honor and to remember them. We must never lose contact with the true meaning of Memorial Day. Americans are notoriously uncomfortable with death, despite producing art and media that is obsessed with violence and death. When it comes to actually encountering and grappling with death, most of us are will woefully ill-prepared. Additionally, some of us resent the military action that has taken the lives of so many young people. We may find it hard to participate in a holiday that is dedicated to military death, despite the clear distinction between military action and military personnel. Finally, less than 1% of Americans currently participate in military service, which means that we may not even know anybody in the armed forces, let alone understand what it is to lose someone in that type of service. Nevertheless, we must not obscure the meaning of this day. It does not matter if it makes us uncomfortable or conflicted or if military death is an attraction to us. People have died doing what they think is right and they've done it on our behalf, whether we understand it or agree with it or not. And for that, we owe them our respect, our gratitude. As I think about Memorial Day 2019 and the difficulties of our time, I am comforted and heartened by the way that we've moved through the difficulties of our past. Mary Hartwell did what was right at the risk of imprisonment when she buried those British soldiers at the outset of the American Revolution. That act is what paved the way for the British consulate to join in the festivities commemorating that war so many years later. Had those bodies remained unburied, there would be no role for the consulate to play. There would be nothing for the British to honor in Lincoln, Massachusetts. But there is. And the annual commemoration is so much richer and more meaningful for it. Furthermore, there has been no time in American history that we have been more divided by intractable differences than we were during the Civil War. And may we never experience that kind of division again. Yet in the aftermath of that bloodshed, disease, and loss, Americans began to find a way back to each other through honoring the fallen soldiers to both sides. It's true that it took the South decades to join in that official celebration, but they came along eventually. And sometimes, sometimes it falls to one side to keep faithfully doing what is right, even when the other side is not yet ready to. And that decency, that compassion for our shared humanity paves the way for relationships to heal over time. So today and tomorrow, we honor our military dead. We do so because it is right. We do so because it is our sacred duty. We do so in order to give meaning to their deaths. In the weeks, months, and years to come, may we be guided by that same spirit that guided the actions of Mary Hartwell and General John A. Logan. Spirit that compels us to do what is right in the face of adversity and obstacles. Spirit that honors the humanity of all people regardless of which side of the conflict they are on. A spirit 
that lays the groundwork for reconciliation, even if the reconciliation itself is years, decades away. May our commitment to doing what's right, regardless of the circumstances, guide us through our current political divisions and into a renewed sense of unity. May we remember with gratitude those who have given their lives in service to our country. May be so. Amen.